There we go. And now we're recording. Good morning, everybody. I am Andrew Langer. Welcome to uh, the show. Uh, we are Jerryless, as you'll see from the description. Uh, Jerry had uh, some scheduling conflicts this morning, but I just couldn't wait. I had to had to go and uh, and join all of you uh, today because there's so much going on. Um, I want to start this. I'll also probably repeat it towards the end of the show. Uh, thank you all very much for the notes, the messages, the Facebook messages, the emails. Uh, uh, keep them coming. Um, you know, the, 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 the talks are still progressing. Um, there's a statement up on the Andrew Langer Show page on Facebook. I'm not going to uh, comment any more on, on that right now. Um, but, uh, but I appreciate, uh, the, the support, uh, as we get through this and we're gonna, we're gonna be offering up programming, um, all sorts of things that are going on. And I'm going to share some more of that with you when we get to the end of the, of the show stuff, stuff that's happening this week, uh, a live event that is going to be happening in a couple of weeks. So, um, uh, where you can join me, uh, it'll be fun. It's a, a, vet a veterans day thing. And I'll get to the details in a minute. Uh, in the meantime, so here's what's going on. Uh, otherwise, in in my world, uh, if you were following me on Facebook over the weekend, you know that, yes, I wasn't on the air um, on Saturday. I was in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, I was uh, attending a meeting, a symposium, whatever you want, uh, um, uh, however you want to call it, uh, a gathering of uh, policy people and, and, and others uh, to talk about supply chain and trade issues, uh, specifically talking about something called the Jones Act. Uh, which you've heard me talk about on the air before, which is an act that has to do with shipping in the United States. And it requires that uh, any ships that are traveling between uh, American um, uh, American ports, so so ports that are, are owned and within the United States of America and its protectorates, uh, those ships uh, must be uh, American made, uh, American owned and American crewed. Um, C-R-E-W-E-D. So they have to have a mostly American crew. I think they can have uh, some percentage of, of uh, foreign nationals on. But, um, you know, talking about this in the context of what's going on with the supply chain and really getting a deep dive into what's happening with the supply chain and shipping issues. Uh, we've talked about it on the air, uh, but, and I don't know, you know, I don't know if I, I've, I've talked about this in the past, not having to do with supply chain, but having to do with my uh, my intense brand loyalty. Uh, if you if you know anything about me, you know that I am I am loyal to certain brands uh, that are out there. I'll say one in the hopes that they might become a sponsor. Wegmans. I've always I've, I'm I'm a huge Wegmans fan. You've heard me talk about this. Toyota. I'm a huge Toyota fan. Um, and, and so, um, but, but the converse of this is I will find products that I like, uh, that nobody else likes and they're soon taken off the market. And I'm extremely sensitive to when things that I want, uh, start to disappear from the marketplace. And, and, you know, uh, one of, one of the examples that I like to use is years ago, uh, I have, when I was transitioning away from a windows smartphone, cause yeah, there were windows smartphones at one time. Uh, I, I transitioned to a, uh, um, a very, uh, an Android phone. It was my fir first Android phone. Cause I'm an Android guy. I'm not an Apple guy. I, I bought something called a Dell streak. Uh, yes, there was a brief period of time when Dell, the computer company made, uh, smartphones. They actually made two of them, a, a, a five inch version and a seven inch version. I got the seven inch version. Cause I like, I like a big phone. If you know anything about me. You know, I like a big phone, but I was probably uh, the only person or one of very few people in the United States or anywhere to buy a Dell. I love this Dell Streak phone. I mean, it was a big phone. It was, you know, I'm going to pull up my phone here. Can't really see it. Oh, got the clock, the clock on here for the phone. But, you know, as you can tell, I like a, I like a big phone. Uh, the Dell Streak was great because you could flip up the screen looking down at myself. You could flip up the screen and it would, uh, and it had a keyboard, an actual physical keyboard on it. I love that because, uh, you know, it's one of those things where now I think it's only Blackberries have a physical screen. Anyway, but I was the only person who bought it or one of very few. And so it went by the wayside. Anyway, as I babble here, I'm not babbling, I promise you. Um, the, um, um, so, so the, the Dell Street goes away. And of course the phone's ringing. This is the, the danger of all of this. Um, 
the uh, uh, so I'm I'm sensitive to to things. So anyway, lose my train of thought entirely. The uh, I, I go to the store last week to buy some stuff in preparation for my trip uh, to to Jacksonville. I was going to be away just for a couple of days. Needed some travel size things, and I noticed the one particular product that I like um, uh, was gone, and it was gone from uh, uh, store number one I went to. I said went over to, to Target. I said, okay, you know, it'll guaranteed it'll be over at Target. Wasn't at Target. Uh, wasn't at a a um, uh, wasn't at a, a, a local pharmacy um, chain pharmacy. Finally, I get to talking to somebody at my grocery store yesterday and they do a search for me. Yeah, it turns out that this this uh, this product that I like is caught up in the whole supply chain thing that's going on. And and so when we sat down over the weekend uh, to talk about this and we met with folks uh, from a, a couple of different shipping companies talking about the issues that are happening. And let's we'll start here and then I'll get into the strategic side of it which is that um, um, it's not just right it's it's there are so many things that are going on with regards to supply chain issues um, we don't have the 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 capacity at these ports uh, is such that the throughput doesn't work you can't get enough ships coming through and some of it is some of it is employees they don't have enough employees to operate the cranes uh, they don't have enough employees to do the inspections they don't have enough employees to to do the the offloading that needs to be done but then it's also that we we know we have a nationwide trucking shortage that's out there so we don't have the drivers we also don't have access to the equipment that's out there so the chassis that actually uh can handle these these uh shipping containers so it is one of these things where everything just gets bottlenecked um and then now this has very little to do with the jones act itself um the jones act is really about more strategic interests and we'll get to that in a moment but it was just very helpful to sort of learn about how all of these things that were all of the rules and regulations that were that were that are that are impacting this situation the economic factors COVID issues we were talking about a situation in uh, in um uh, california uh, uh the port of long beach california where um uh where the um they're they're dealing with the issue of drivers pulling up uh, they have to wait, you know, more than eight hours, eight to 12 hours. There's an issue there too, right? Um, but they can't idle their trucks. So if it's cold, they can't idle their trucks because of California environmental laws. And, and, and let's underscore this. When you have these kinds of bottlenecks, you know, truck drivers are paid by the job. They're not paid by the hour. In, in most cases, if they're independent contractors. So if they're sitting and waiting, they're losing money. So it really is, it's, it's, a, it's, a real, it's a real mess. Then we got to talking about not just the, the Jones Act, not just uh, um, uh, the supply chain issues, but the Jones Act, and, and I've talked about this before. So the, as I said, we talked about what the Jones Act does. It's important for a, a number of reasons, not the least of which is to maintain um, what is a vital national interest in the United States, which is both the shipbuilding, and which means the ship repair industry. Uh, it, it's vital for national security issues because of the role that the merchant marine plays and, and that a lot of these um, uh, mariners play in terms of homeland security issues. But we went and we spent a little bit of time talking. I want to pull this up. Uh, we spent a little bit of time talking about China. Glasses are on now. Um, and, and the, the, what, what China is doing, let me, let me share my screen here. Let me see if I can find this. Um, actually, let me do this first. Let me pull this up over here. Hi, everybody. There we go. Share the screen. We're going to get this, uh, uh, done a little bit better in the future. Anyway, you can see this. So this is a, um, a, a snapshot of China's investments, not around the world, but in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, and talking about things that China is doing. And it's, I, we, you know, obviously you've heard me talk about China as a threat before, as a strategic threat. And, and, I, and it's, a, it's a situation in which, Jerry and I talked about this last week, right? Um, back, in the in 2001 one of the reasons why the bush administration was distracted from the threat of al-qaeda was because they were focused on the threat from china i mean so we're talking more than 20 years ago 
um, or 20 years ago, exactly, that we were that we were looking at these things and we were dealing with, the, with these issues. Um, understanding that, and this gets into what, what former Defense Secretary Robert Gates was saying just last weekend, the weekend before this past one, uh, on, uh, on 60 Minutes, um, talking about one of the things that Donald Trump got right and that many people got wrong was the understanding of the threat from China, right? We, we, we talk about this. We talk about one of the um, articles of faith, I will say, uh, from my, my friends, and I, and I say my friends in the small L libertarian, the, many of them in the, in the small L libertarian community, in the global free market community, is this belief that, A, if you're trading with people, then they're not your enemies. Well, that may or may not be true. Um, and that B, the more prosperous a society can be created, uh, the more free that society is going to be. And, and what we are now understanding is that the Chinese government, the, the Chinese Communist Party, the Maoists, have created an environment which can be both incredibly economically prosperous, and, and for China, it's a select few, um, but it is a, um, uh, it is a um, uh, you know, because there are more than a billion people in China, uh, it is... Um, uh, there, there are there are many of them, multiples of millions of them who are prosperous. Uh, but it is a it is a it's an oppressive society for everybody, uh, with you know all kinds of ways, including the social crediting system, which a lot of uh, uh, progressives want to see applied here in the United States. Social crediting system. It is a way of uh, government granting privilege privileges, what we would consider to be rights, but the government would be consider what the government in China considers privileges, based upon uh, how you how closely you follow uh, the ideal of what the Chinese Communist Party wants you to be. I, I mean, let that sink in for a moment. Think about that. So the Chinese want to export that abroad. I mean, they listen. They they want to they want to extend their power abroad, um, and and so what they have been doing. Uh, is a, one of the ways is that we know this. We know that 90% of all shipping, I'm sorry, 90% of all goods across the globe are moved via ship. It's just the way it is. It's a it's an easy way to transport goods. And it was two um, um, geostrategists of the late 19th and early 20th centuries um, a, a gentleman named Mahan, Alfred Thayer Mahan, who was an admiral who wrote a book called The Influence of Sea Power Upon History. Uh, and then uh, another gentleman named Alfred McKinder, who was a, um, a, a British citizen, who talked about the importance of sea power in terms of uh, uh, controlling global commerce and in terms of exerting uh, power across the globe. Interestingly enough, uh, it is something that the president alluded to, but I don't think he quite understands in the concept of over the horizon force projection that you were talking about in, in the Afghanistan withdrawal. Um, you know, it, it anyway, I, I won't, I won't digress into sort of geo strategy and, 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 and the particulars there. The point is the Chinese well understand that if you can control shipping lanes and you can control, then, then you can control global commerce. And one of the ways you can control global shipping rent lanes is by controlling ports. And so the Chinese government, in addition to investing in infrastructure around the world, um, uh, generally, specifically, they've been investing in, in, in ports. And China does something fascinating. And I use that term loosely. China will, will loan governments the money uh, for rebuilding ports. Uh, and then when the government can't keep up, when the government of that country can't keep up with the payments on the, the, the construction costs, China essentially repossesses the port that they've rebuilt. Uh, and it gives them enormous power. Uh, and they've done this. I want to say it was done in Sri Lanka. I got to go back and look, but, but set that aside. So we look at this. And now I'm going to put my glasses back on. So you look at what they're doing in controlling shipping in the Middle East, right? So you've got the Suez Canal that's over here. Um, um, you've got uh, uh, the other the other ports over here, um, and and so essentially, 
uh, between essentially between China itself and here uh, in in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, em enormous amount of investment investment in India here. Uh, there is a word that they want to build. The Chinese government wants to build a canal uh, here in the, uh, the, the the in, in Thailand uh, to essentially cut shipping time. So instead of having to go down and around here through the Straits of Malacca, uh, they can they can just cut right across and, and save shipping time. But the point is, China uh, is spending an enormous amount of, of uh, time and energy doing this. So, uh, you know, this this reinforces what we're talking about in terms of uh, in terms of. And I'm going to stop sharing here. Like, there we go. Not to see this, uh, it reinforces. Um, uh, you know, just the the China has a a, a mind towards a very long game here. Uh, I spend a lot of time talking about trade issues in my regular day job. Not going to bore you with those details. Um, you can go back and look at some of my, my, my writing. Maybe I'll put some of it up on the Andrew Langer Show page. Um, but, you know, we have, to, we, we, we have to remember that there is a real-world impact. We talk about the issue of substance matter. There's a real-world impact to what it is that we do and the decisions that we make um, and, and that we can be so focused on the near term and the near term demands, so we can be so focused on political gamesmanship uh, that we lose sight that we have enemies who are looking very long ways down the road, um, especially in terms of global economic competition. Uh, and they are making decisions now that may cost them huge amounts of money now, but will pay off because of their global economic dominance in the long term. Anyway, so with that in mind, let, let's shift gears here. You know, we're just going to go headlong into other things. I'll probably go for about uh, about 20 minutes today. Um, actually, let me let me tee this up before we before I start sharing again. Um, so we've got this is this is always fun. Um, so we've got a, an election going on in Virginia right now. Uh, we're coming down to the wire here. Uh, very interesting, some of the discussions that I had with colleagues over the weekend about this. You all know that I am very Eeyore-ish uh, about the possibility that uh, that uh, uh, Glenn Youngkin can beat Terry McAuliffe. Uh, I have colleagues who are, uh, are just the opposite, uh, who think that this is uh, already baked, that uh, that uh, um, that McAuliffe is going to uh, is going to lose. Uh, I've uh, listen. I've long said this is McAuliffe's race to lose. It can be done. He seems to be doing everything in his power to lose this race, uh, and yet, um, uh, yet the, the the conditions are always in his favor. Uh, the way the conditions are on the ground are in his favor. It's gonna a lot of it's gonna come down to turnout, turnout, and as we've said, moving small amounts of people from column A to column B. Um, with that in mind, actually, before we get to uh, the president, I want to go here. This is this is part of the problem uh, that McAuliffe is having. Uh, this is a sign that reportedly went up. Oh, hello. This is a sign that reportedly went up in uh, Arlington, Virginia. Uh, I pulled this off here. Let's uh, let's grab it. All right. So uh, as you can see now, all right. You you see the sign. The sign speaks for itself. Uh, I don't know who uh, this uh, Hope person is, uh, Patrick Hope. I don't know who that is. Um, I am dubious of this sign. I will tell you that straight away. Oh, and for those of you who are listening, because I'm going to podcast this. Uh, the sign was in Arlington County. Um, it, it says, uh, keep parents out of classrooms, vote McAuliffe, keep Virginia blue. Now, I can't imagine. I cannot imagine. Oh, and you know something? There's no... Uh, there's no um, there's no byline on it now. It looks real, right? Because it's got looks like it's got both sides on it. But there's no uh, there's no treasury line on it, which to me smacks of uh, uh, it being a fake sign, i.e., put up by uh, by Republicans. Now it's effective. Um, I, I my, 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 let's start here. Let's assume for a moment that it is a real sign put out by uh, Democrats. Um, it is a stupid move if it is. Um, I don't think they're that stupid. Um, I, because I, I think that the Democrats know that McAuliffe made a massive mistake by saying what he said uh, on uh, on uh, you know in that debate. It has caused great pain. He came, he's being quoted out of context. Uh, this, that, and the other thing. No, it, it gave body to what 
uh, many Virginians have already suspected. Uh, the, the Democrats don't want parents' involvement in schools. Uh, but so, so that being said, I don't, I don't think this is a, uh, this is a, a real sign. Um, so, you know, so, so take that, uh, take that, uh, as you will, uh, let's go here though, because so we talked about, uh, uh, Barack Obama, um, oh, I did, I'm sorry. Barack Obama was in Virginia over the weekend. I talked about this on the John justice show on Monday. Um, but they, it, and, and, and that's interesting to talk about the free fall here. Part of the reason why part of the reason it actually may be more of a, of a, a, the disease itself than the symptom. But one of the, one of the factors that's gone into this is uh, the Virginia's first black governor uh, was Doug Wilder and Doug Wilder is still uh, uh, incredibly active in Virginia democratic politics. Um, Doug Wilder had some very, I'm not going to say unkind things, uh, but very tepid things to say about Terry McAuliffe, uh, and the current state of the Virginia Democratic Party and how they are taking the black vote for granted. Uh, as a result of that, uh, President Barack Obama came to Virginia to campaign for Terry McAuliffe um, and essentially started gaslighting. I should have pulled up that audio and I didn't. Essentially started gaslighting uh, Virginia voters saying, oh, this, uh, this uh, culture war is a fake thing, blah, 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 and so on and so forth, which again, is like the worst kind of gaslighting because as you see it, we see the culture war happening in front of us. So not to be outdone, uh, President Biden came to Virginia to do a rally. By the way, um, Vice President Pence is going to be in Loudoun County tomorrow. Uh, the Maryland Republican Party has sent out an email. I'll put that stuff up on the Andrew Langer Show page on Facebook if you want to go. Uh, but here is... Uh, here is, uh, uh, well, there are a couple of different clips I'm going to play from this. And I want to make sure, share sound, there we go. Um, President Biden was in town. This is from Red State here. Um, um, here, here, oh, I love this. So you will recall that several years ago, and I predicted this on the air, that several years ago on a Friday, Governor Ralph Northam was caught up in a scandal. Uh, in which uh, he was accused of either being in blackface or wearing a Klan mask in a yearbook photo. Uh, and then later uh, that same weekend admitted that he had worn blackface to do a Michael Jackson impression uh, at some event. Uh, and I said then, and I was right, that uh, uh, if the governor survived for 96 hours, uh, he was going to remain in office. And in fact, he did. Um, but uh, 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 President Biden, then uh, uh, a former vice president wrote, uh, do I want to pull this up? No, I'm not going to put it, but you can, you can see this. Uh, he wrote, there, uh, you know, back in 2019, so just barely two years ago, he wrote, there is no place for racism in America. Governor Northam has lost all moral authority and should resign immediately. Justin Fairfax is the leader Virginia needs now, which, you know, if you know anything about Justin Fairfax, no. So, uh, you know, here, uh, less than two years later, here is um, uh, the President of the United States talking about his pal, uh, uh, Ralph Northam. It goes without saying how much I appreciate your current governor, Ralph Northam. Where's Ralph? There you are, pal. Thanks. Yeah, there you go. Uh, but no tolerance for racism, uh, except for when you're President of the United States and you need, uh, and you need him as a pal. So, so there you go. Uh, so the President then went on to talk uh, talking about, uh, 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 talking about, uh, I think it was education. Anyway, uh, here, here is the president uh, mumbling semi-coherently. In fact, we're taking a page from Terry's book when he was governor and when he'd be governor next time. We're emerging from this pandemic. We want to expand peak pre-K for three and four-year-olds, millions of pre-K students. There you go. President of the United States. We want to expand uh, pre-K for blah, 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 blah. Yeah. So uh, uh, losing, losing steam there. Then, and, and this is, this is interesting. I pulled up an article this morning. Oh, here, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'll come back to this in a second. Um, pulled up an article this morning uh, about um, negotiations that were being done uh, up on the Hill. And I can't remember the member of Congress who said this, but, but, you know, there was zero discussion. Now, Listener Marty 
Texan and was texting in all the time as we were talking about uh, 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 bailout bills from the early part of the Biden administration, uh, was texting in about inflation. We spent a lot of time talking about inflation. I asked, you know, guys like Steve Moore and Phil Kirpin and Grover Norquist uh, about inflation and spending and 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 what the 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 profligate spending was going to mean. Um, and so we were talking about it. We knew what was going to happen. Uh, and yet apparently uh, there was not apparently. And, 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 I, and I actually I shouldn't be so surprised by this. And I'm not. There was no discussion of inflation and inflationary pressures that this would do. And, and you know, it's it's interesting because there's a new term for it. You know, it used to be classical Keynesianism, you know, the, this idea that you had to prime the prump, prime the prump prime the pump in order to uh, in order to get uh, uh, the economy going again, which is garbage. It, 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 you don't need to do that. You don't need to prime the pump. Um, you, you just need to, to reinstate the conditions of a of a free and open economy in order for an economy to improve. It, it's like what um, my good friend at, at the Competitive Enterprise Institute, Wayne Cruz, says. You don't have to teach the grass to grow. You just have to remove the rocks in order to gain the access to air, sunlight, and water. It's, it's all, you, all you need to do. And so this is why Donald Trump, when he came into office, he immediately started engaging in regulatory reform. That regulatory reform had an immediate impact. Uh, what did Joe Biden do when he came into office? Well, he started creating greater regulatory uncertainty and, in fact, reinstating the regulatory state once again. And this is not to say that we had no regulations under Donald Trump. We did. We had a, we Donald Trump inherited a massive regulatory state. What Donald Trump didn't do was add appreciably to that regulatory state, kept regulatory cost growth under two to three percent, which is fantastic, as opposed to Barack Obama, who essentially doubled the cost of regulations in America in his term from one point two trillion dollars a year to two point two five trillion dollars a year. So when you don't add regulatory burdens, and you keep regulatory certainty and you create more transparency. This has the uh, effect of stimulating the economy. Imagine that. But when you, in your first week, you wipe out regulatory transparency and you immediately start going down the road of growing the regulatory state again, guess what? It hamstrings the economy. And if you devalue the dollar by printing more of them, and you and you essentially you start spurring inflation if you start driving up costs otherwise through the regulatory process if you make it more expensive to deliver uh, uh goods to the marketplace if you make it more expensive to bring labor on board if you make it more expensive to start a new business or engage in your business well yeah this has the effect of increasing prices and so, you know, Joe Biden can talk about uh, 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 wages going up, but those those wage increases, when they're adjusted for inflation, Americans are losing money in their pocketbooks. So anyway, so with that in mind, uh, here is uh, here is the president of the United States uh, talking about uh, talking about how we're on the right track. This, of course, despite the fact that uh, Americans think otherwise. People are buying more things. Manufacturing is up. We're on the move, but we're on the right track. We got we're on the right track. People are buying more things. You know, people are buying more things because they can actually get out to the grocery store. You know, they're finding that their their choices are limited. You know, they're they're finding that uh, um um and, and many of them listen. Let, let's be let's be fair here. Many of them are going back to work. That's a good thing. But so many more of them are being paid to stay home. That's not a good thing. So it's interesting. Let's uh, let's uh, let me let me shift gears here. Uh, speaking of which, when we talk about consumer choices, right? One of the uh, one of the best one of the best uh, examples of folks who sort of don't understand the way an economy works uh, is uh, is um, uh, um, Bernie Sanders, senator from Vermont. So uh, Sanders was cornered. I want to pull this up. Uh, Sanders was cornered in um, uh, in the, the hallway up on the Capitol. Uh, asked about the state of the economy made some grandiose claims and here is a a uh, a particular whopper from from uh, bernie sanders if you ask the american people today what is most important 
the conversation sets. And one is sitting in light of the ripoff by the pharmaceutical industry. They think that it's insane that in some cases we pay 10 times more for the same drug as the people in other countries. All right, let, let's, let's stop it there for a sec. Now, this is a canard, a prevarication, because drug costs in this country are high for a lot of reasons. Some of it has to do with regulatory costs. Some of it has to do with other nations engaging in price controls so that Americans are forced to bear the burden of, uh, of, uh, of recouping of these drug companies, recouping their investments. Some of it also has to do with arcane regulatory uh, and, and uh, uh, patent laws and patent rules uh, that prevent more, uh, more inexpensive, less expensive, let's not add adjectives here, less expensive generic options from coming onto the marketplace. And, and yet Senator Sanders is doing nothing about that because Senator Sanders, it's the old adage, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Senator Sanders has one solution to this. And that one solution is price controls here in America. If price controls are good enough, and, and it's funny because it gets down to, you remember, Senator Sanders was the one who said, I don't understand why there are 14 different deodorants on the marketplace. Not understanding that, ha that A, that's consumer choice, that helps keep prices down due to competition, et cetera, et cetera. But what the Senator doesn't seem to grasp, and if he does, then he's being dishonest, is that his price control policy, what he wants, his goal of price control, will result in fewer consumer choices, which means that A, the cost of drugs will go up and the taxpayers will ultimately foot the bill, uh, but also less investment in new innovations down the road. What we want is we want innovation and innovation, right? Innovation makes drugs better and more effective and they make Americans healthier. And what it means is that down the road, more generics come on the market. They may not do the same thing as the most innovative drug that's out there, but still do a lot. And, and therefore, again, Americans have greater access, greater greater choices here. Let's uh, let's continue to see what, the, what uh, uh, Senator Sanders had to say. Well, last year, the pharmaceutical industry made $50 billion in profit. And right now has... 1,500 paid lobbyists here in Washington to make sure we don't lower the cost of the prescription drugs. Oh, they have 1,500 lobbyists. Oh, my God. How dare they? How dare they have lobbyists? Now, listen, I'm not going to say I agree with uh, the pharmaceutical industry's lobbyists all the time, but we can't say that there are boogeymen of lobbyists because I would dare say that on the other side, whether it's the AARP or whether it's uh, uh, Big Labor or, or whether it's any one of a number, I'm fairly certain that there is probably an equal number of people, uh, uh, an equal number of lobbyists uh, on, the, on the side advocating, as Senator Sanders wants, uh, for price controls on drugs. So to my mind, any serious reconciliation bill must include real Medicare negotiations with the pharmaceutical industry to lower the cost of prescription drugs. That's probably all right. So, so then, then, by the way, this is this is of course one of the major sticking points in this reconciliation bill is how much money the federal government would spend on prescription drugs. I, I mean, it really is an insane way of doing business. But, uh, but, but you know, and and on that on that score, by the way, the um uh because I'm not going to I'm not going to get to it uh, today probably but uh um the reconciliation bill is still in in massive amounts of limbo despite the fact that Steny Hoyer is out there saying oh we could have something by next Tuesday it's not going to happen um the good thing is you had Manchin saying that he because we talked Jerry and I talked about this last week um uh, Manchin is, is is seems to indicate that they've effectively scrapped even the $10,000 cumulative threshold let me explain Remember, it was floated that the IRS would be given the power to look into your bank account anytime there was a transaction of more than $600. That got scrapped, and they tried to pull a rope-a-dope and say, well, we're going to make it uh, $10,000. Well, $10,000 wasn't the transaction number. It was $10,000 of cumulative transactions in a year, so about $850 a month. So if you have $850 coming in and going out of your bank account every month, the IRS would have had the power to snoop. 
thankfully that all seems to have been scrapped uh, at, at this point in time. Um, and there are some other things, but yeah, so this is, this is one of the major sticking points. The issue most on people's minds, maybe the issue second most on people's minds is the understanding that it is really insane that in the wealthiest country in the history of the world, we have tens of millions of Americans, older Americans, who have no teeth in their mouth, who are unable to digest the food that they're eating. What? People who cannot hear and communicate with their grandkids because they have no hearing aids. People are unable to see. Well, this is America, richest country in the history of the I, I, I have no idea where that's coming from. Now, I would, all right, I would dare say there are probably tens of millions of Americans who are, are missing a tooth or two for temporary or permanent or whatever. That I don't know. But to suggest that in a country of what 330 million people right that's the that's the number we used that something on the order that 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 tens of millions of them have no teeth and are unable to digest food that's that's crazy unless he's unless he's saying that it's tens of millions who have no teeth or can't hear which is a weird conflation of things and it's funny and i'll i'll, I'll throw him under the bus here um, because Jerry and I had a conversation the other day about, uh, about the hearing aid issue. Um, when I get him back, we'll have a, a greater conversation. The, the issue, right. The, the issue we're talking about is whether one of the issues they're talking about, at least that this may not be what Sanders is talking about is whether or not to create a new category of hearing aid products that don't require a visit to an audiologist, uh, and don't require that aren't labeled hearing aids don't require a prescription, uh, but could be sold over the counter. I don't have a particular problem with this uh, in the same way that I don't have a particular problem with uh, with you being able to buy, you should be able to buy contact lenses over the counter. Um, I, I sort of get that there should probably be a difference between what is called a hearing aid and some sort of hearing advancement device. You know, we see them all the time, right? You see them on TV. Uh, uh, I think it's Bell and Howell. Uh, 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 offers up something like that, something you can wear in your ear. They've had them for years, right? There was that, um, there's that video that goes around that purports to show somebody walking around in the 1930s with a cell phone in their ear, and it turns out it was some kind of a hearing device or somebody else who had a, what the, some were saying was a um, um, iPod. in their ear and no, it's, it turns out it was just a, a hearing aid device. Serious negotiations on the part of Medicare with the pharmaceutical industry, lower the cost of prescription drugs. That's what the American people want. All right, so he just repeats himself. It, it should, and it should, you know, whatever reconciliation bill, oh, any reconciliation bill has to include tooth money, right? We need tooth money. Anyway, Ed, that, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, strange there. So I'm um, going to shift to some other local news real quick. I don't want to go more than about 45 minutes today. Uh, uh, we have uh, Peter Francho selected a running mate, and the woman's name is now escaping me, so let me let me pull that up. Uh, her name is um, um, her name is uh, da, 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 Monique Anderson Walker. She's a Prince George's County Council member, which I guess is the flip of uh, Rashern Baker uh, selecting someone from Montgomery County as his running mate. So clearly. Um, I mean, it, it really is amazing, right? When you think about it. Um, so the, the, the candidates, so I, I may be missing somebody. I probably am. Uh, the major candidates, right? We got Tom Perez, national figure, but he lives in Montgomery County. Uh, you got Rashern Baker uh, from uh, uh, Prince George's County running with somebody from Montgomery County. You got uh, um, Peter Francho. And I'm going to say this, Tacoma Park straddles Prince George's and Montgomery County, selecting somebody from Prince George's County as his running mate. Uh, the question, of course, is, as always, is which Peter Francho are we going to get on the campaign trail? I still think this is Peter Francho's race to lose. Uh, is he going to be iconoclastic Peter Francho, uh, or is he going to be uh, Tacoma Park Peter Francho? Uh, and obviously, you have folks who are pulling out all the stops to deal with him. Uh, there was some um, uh, allegation that he uh, tried to put his thumb on the scale on some development issue uh, in his neighborhood. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, we got this here. Glasses are back on. Yeah, you know something. I'm going to share this screen because uh, this is this is uh, this is kind of fun. 
So, you know, I've spent a lot of time talking about uh, uh, the inspector general's issue, inspectors general, thank you, issue in both Baltimore City and Baltimore County. Uh, you had that uh, uh, very unfortunate incident uh, in Baltimore County in which they tried to strip the inspector general of her powers there. They failed. Baltimore City is moving down this road. Um, but rather, you know, but, but, you know, not to be deterred in all of this, which is strange, um, it, it, you know, John Olszewski Jr., Johnny O, uh, the county executive in Baltimore County, he has, <laughs> he's gonna, he's gonna, he's gonna do an end run here or try to do an end run here. He's setting up a new ethics panel in Baltimore County. And, uh, uh the whole point of this is now. Most counties in Maryland have an ethics panel and they're supposed to deal with complaints of ethical violations. This is a little bit different than what the inspector general ought to do, uh, which is to investigate issues of, of fraud and abuse internally, et cetera. Make sure that, that, that the internal dealings from a legal as well as ethical perspective are all done above board. Uh, this panel is going to be set up to review both things in Baltimore County. Um, uh, it's going to be set up to look at uh, um, uh, both how the ethics board is functioning, but also uh, to look at this new inspector general uh, and her office and how she's doing her job. Uh, and they're going to make recommendations this summer with a final report to be released uh, next November. So, so I, 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 we'll go through the names real quick while I have it here. Um, uh, the executive director of Common Cause Maryland. Um, the Assistant Adjutant General of the Maryland Army National Guard. It seems like an odd, uh, uh, I, I don't know if I, I, I that distresses me uh, because I, I don't think this person should be distracted from her job as the Assistant Adjutant General to serve on a panel like this. Uh, former Administrative Judge, uh, former IG for the Department of Human Resources, a lawyer and the Chair of the Baltimore County Ethics Commission. So the Chair of the Ethics Commission is gonna be on this panel, I guess. I don't know, uh, I, I guess to provide some kind of balance in that regard. Uh, so, uh, so that's, um, uh, so anyway, it, it, you know, more, more, I'm going to call them shenanigans. I think there are shenanigans now. Okay. Deep breath. Thank you all for joining me. All right. Got a couple of things coming up. Um, uh, and there are things that you can participate in things that are just, just going to be happening. Uh, as we're sort of still working these other things through, I will refer to it obliquely as oblique, ob obliquely as possible. So let's start here with Friday. Let me uh, let me pull this up. Uh, I got some big stuff happening uh, here on Friday. I'm not going to do this live. Uh, I will rebroadcast it later. Uh, but uh, I've been I, I was negotiating with this before the launch happened. Uh, we're making it happen. Uh, I'm going to be talking with one of the Blue Origin astronauts, a guy named Glenn DeVries. I'll say it now. I went to high school with Glenn. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm, I was glad to trade messages with him. We were, it wasn't just that we went to high school together. We were part of the same friend group. Uh, so Glenn's going to join me on Friday. I'm not going to do a Facebook Live of it, I don't think. I may talk to them about it. I just think it would be just be too complicated. Uh, the plan right now is for me to interview him and then I'll upload uh, the, the both the video and the audio, but it'll be a wide ranging conversation, you know, like the wide ranging conversations we have. We're going to talk about Glenn's journey. We're going to talk about his love of space. Obviously, we're going to talk about what it was like to go up into space with William Shatner. Um, so that'll be fun. So you're going to want to uh, so you're going to want to stay tuned uh, to that as well. Uh, then we're going to try something else here real quick. So that's this Friday. Um, but more important, not more importantly, as important, I got a, a live event coming up um, and I want you to join me at it. This will be fun. Now, I know this is a little out of the way for some of you, uh, but this came up. Uh, a, a, a friend of mine at a, a Patriots group uh, asked me to uh, to give some remarks at an event on Veterans Day. It is happening on Veterans Day. That's Thursday, November 11th uh, at 530 uh, p.m. Uh, and it's going to be held in Union, I'm sorry, at Union Station in Columbus Circle. So I'm going to pull up the map here. Let me see if I can just do this without. Hey, hopefully you can see this. So here's Union Station. You take the train in like this. Uh, right out across from the entrance to Union Station is Columbus Circle. 
Uh, I will be speaking there at 530. There are going to be veterans there. We'll be talking about, you know, America's, uh, 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 what, what America owes its veterans on the important legacy of veterans, the, the things that uh, veterans uh, have fought for and are fighting for still. Uh, and then spend a little bit of time actually talking about uh, health care for veterans and some innovative ideas to deliver the health care that these veterans are owed. So you're going to want to tune in, uh, not going to want to tune in, you're going to want to join me there again 5.30 p.m. on Thursday, November 11th, that is Veterans Day, uh, Columbus Circle in uh, uh, across the street from Union Station in Washington, D.C. You can take the Mark train in. Uh, you don't even have to go out anywhere in D.C. Uh, you come out, you see me, I'm, 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 I'm going to give some remarks, uh, say hello, would love to see you there, so, so, so join me there. Um, and then, of course, as I said, Friday, uh, I'll have this video up uh, of Glenn DeVries. Uh, Ask around it. More events coming up. I'm going to say it again, what I said at the beginning of the show. Um, thank you all very much for your emails and messages uh, in support, letting me know you want me back on the air at WBAL. There are a lot of balls in the air that, right now, uh, lots of discussions that are taking place. Uh, and I appreciate those of you who have reached out to WBAL's management uh, in support of me and my show and my continued broadcast on WBAL. So uh, please uh, uh, go ahead. That information is all on the Andrew Langer Show page uh, on Facebook. Uh, thank you all uh, so very much. Actually, let me go here. Thank you all so very much for um, uh, for joining me today. Uh, I'm sorry that Jerry couldn't be here to join us. As you all know, it would have been a much better conversation uh, with my having uh, uh, Jerry here. Uh, stay tuned to the Andrew Langer Show page. If you're seeing me, you already know facebook.com slash Andrew Langer Show. Uh, have a good day, everybody. Have a great week. Have fun and stay safe.